Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John, this is Menu True Nerd, and this is Hitman Blood Money Requiem, the final mission. Also, incidentally, apparently, video 100 that we've ever put out, and I, therefore, you know, I've got some stuff for that, but uh, first things first, I think we've got to stop being dead. And in this game, you start being dead by rotating the analog sticks. Let's complete this mission. Accent only. First things first, run. Get out of the church. Do not, do not hang around. Okay, I've just had a very good first run around the corner because I basically, you can see my health hasn't really gone down yet. Which is a great thing. And now I just hide in this corner. What you can see is because everyone is a critical target, that means everyone is conveniently... Okay, first gun goes down. Okay, next person goes down. Okay, next. 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 Okay, someone has a gun. Someone has a gun. I saw someone who still has a gun. Oi. God damn it, get the gun, get the gun, do not shoot me. Not till I've got your gun out of your hands. There we go. Okay. Now as you can see, they just conveniently decide to shuffle around and hide behind the reception. Now how are we doing? Okay, we've got all of them that hang around in this area. Whew, okay. We've got all of them and we've got we've got about half our health left. That's not too bad. You notice they never actually fight back, even though, you know, I'm not holding a gun and they outnumber me about 8 to 1. They'll never fight back. They also won't go too far from here. So, okay. That's not too bad. Um, I've got half my health. I'm going to leave these guys here for now because they now can't do anything to me. Guards who were armed will never attack you in a fist fight. Uh, only guards who start off unarmed will ever do that, so... I'm just going to leave these guys here for now and go and deal with the other problems. I don't want to invest the time dealing with these guys if it might be about to go wrong down the hill. So let's be clear on what's also going to happen. What we've got, and we can check our map because, as I say, everyone's a critical target. What we've got down here are five people. So one of the two, so two of them will be the journalist and the priest. Both under arm will never attack you, not a problem. Two of them will be bodyguards and one of them will be the wheelchair guy. The wheelchair guy is a real problem, mainly because he has, he's really good shot and he's got a semi-automatic pistol that does a lot of damage. What I've got to do is aggro him and then get back over into cover before he kills me. That's going to be difficult. It's especially difficult because no matter what difficulty you're on, you can't save in this mission. So I've got to get their attention... That was enough. Okay, yeah. Just fire your gun. Now I just need to get into safety. And I will use the shape of the building to partly cover myself. And now just loop round and swivel in. Those guards... <laughs> they're just having a reception party. That's fine. And now we just wait for these guys. So that's the wheelchair guy. He's making his way up nice and slow. And the wheelchair guy, incidentally, has magical powers. Um, he can just figure out where you are and he'll kind of just home in on you. But that works really well to my advantage. Because uh, we can just watch him come through the window in a second. Yep, there he is. Hello, wheelchair guy. I forget your name. I don't pay that much attention to the plot these days. So now, as he's coming here, we will just head straight down these stairs. And wait for him, because in a second, he'll get to the stairs, and something wonderful will happen. Yeah, the physics just broke. That's, uh, he's just, uh, and as you can see, he's just had an accident. Why? God only knows. For some reason, even though we saw in the cutscene before this mission began, him taking the wheelchair down these stairs... Uh, his wheelchair, if it touches the stairs, that's an instant death for him. We just didn't take his gun too. Excellent. And that leaves just two armed guards left in this entire mission. 
problem is they're actually hanging out. Yeah, they're refusing to cooperate. I'd like them to come here. So I'm going to just lure them in if I can. There we go. That's got their attention. Are they coming now? Yep, they're totally coming now. I've just got to survive these two guards that are going to charge me. It's all I've got to do. Uh-oh. That's not good. That's not good. That's not good, actually. Okay. Woo I missed one. I missed a shot there. Okay. He's now disarmed. He's useless, but... Ooh, I'm low on health now. Ooh, I'm low on health now. That was bad. Oh, okay. With that, I'm pretty sure we've won. Because there should be two people left down at the bottom. The journalist and the priest. Okay. There we go. That's literally everyone disarmed. Ooh, that was close to the end there. I messed up a couple of the uh, messed up a couple of the grabs. If you do a shove when someone else is in the room, obviously there's nothing to stop the other guy just shooting you. Now all you do, you just human shield them, and every single one of these people has to have an accident. And that's not that hard to do. Easiest way to guarantee an accident is to bring them round the back of this staircase here. Because as you're aware, like, you know, the uh, the physics engine can be a little temperamental. And in this mission, you don't have any rails for an auto-free kill. So what I'm going to suggest you do no is you come back here. against this wall. You face the wall. You back again until you're actually hard against the wall. You line yourself up so that this line down this staircase is perfectly straight. So you know you're in a good position. And then you just press Y to drop body. And the person drops down the stairs... And as you can see, that is a red X, and he's done. And all we're going to do now is we're going to do that for each and every person. But for you see, ladies and gentlemen, as this is my 100th video, these people are not just normal people. Each of these people represents a question. I decided to ask the subreddit, the Many True Nerds subreddit, which I do keep if you're kind of on Reddit. Uh, that's where I kind of do my channel updates, by the way. If you're on Reddit and you kind of want a bit more Many True Nerds in your life, uh, I do post there, you know, semi-regularly. Make sure you always kind of see our videos the moment they come out. And, you know, also it's uh, it's just, uh, you get a bit more insight into the community. I very often post questions about what you'd like to see next. So if you want to kind of have a bit more ability to influence what I do on the channel, that's a really good place to follow. So, uh... I asked that community if uh, anyone had any questions that they wanted answered about Many True Nerd, about me, about the video series, anything like that. And uh, yeah, a few people had questions for me. And as I'm going to be very slowly making uh, about 10 people have accidents by falling down these exact same sets of stairs on top of each other for a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes, if I'm fortunate, thought, you know what? May as well answer some of those questions. So few of the questions that got posed to me. So someone asked me what the first game I ever played was, and I had to think back, because I've been, I've been gaming for a very long time. I was kind of, um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, kind of one of the first generation that really had home console games. Um, and, uh, but I kind of have, uh, my, uh, my first game is actually a bit strange, because technically it, uh, it doesn't really fit in with uh, when I would have been, uh, when I was actually around, uh, because the console, the first console, that I had was the Colco Vision. I, if I can find a picture, I, I'll put it on screen right now. Oh, fantastic. Look at the controller. Look at the controller. An analog stick over a decade before the N64 claimed to be the first controller to have an analog stick as standard. And like nine buttons and a zero and a hash button. Magnificent. First game I ever played on that. And incidentally, um, that had the original Donkey Kong on it, which I had, but that's not the first game I have a memory of playing. The first game I have a memory of playing... Oh, come on, there you go. First game I have a memory of playing is Mousetrap, which was kind of a Pac-Man ripoff, but I think it was better than Pac-Man because basically, like, the maze was full of little coloured gates, red, yellow, or blue. You could push a button and it would open or close doors, so you could open ways through to things, and then... And you could like lock your enemies in, but obviously locking your enemies in would close other gates around the um, around uh, the map, so you couldn't uh, you couldn't fix, so you couldn't actually keep enemies there forever. Um, and sometimes you could lock yourself away until the enemies went away. 
And like there were power pills, there were bones, but rather than a power pill, which you just kind of had to use immediately, you could just, um, you could store bones and use them whenever was useful to you. And then you could like eat the cats that were following you, but like the Pac-Man ghost, they came back. But every time a cat came back, it was faster than before. So eating them too early was actually a really bad idea. And there was a magic rainbow thing in the middle of the map. And if you went into it, it teleported you at random to one of the corners, which was a really good get out of jail free card, but obviously could just land you in just, you know, equally big trouble. And there was a hawk that flew over the map that was the only thing that didn't have to obey any of the war. Oh, it's just a great game. It's a great game. And I kind of, it's one of one of the first games that I actually kind of, um, that I sank hours into. And it's also um, kind of one of the first kinds I've played like a strategy game because I played kind of games like um, Donkey Kong and there was like a um, there was like a there was a spaceship shoot that was actually quite cool um, on on the Colco. But it was the first time I'd really played like a game that actually required like some thought and some strategy. And it kind of made me think that kind of maybe video games could be like a bit more of a thinking thing. Uh, and that's kind of stuck with me a lot since because I, I like a lot of strategy games these days. So that was the first game that I have a really strong memory of. But uh, the same person also asked, um, what's the first game that I was like super into? The first game I was really passionate about. For that, I have to, uh, I have to take you back in time. I have to take you back in time to 1997 when I'm horrified by the possibility that some of you watching may potentially not have been born. Um, so, oh god, I'm old. I'm old, ladies and gentlemen. Many True Nerd is extremely old. It's 1997, and it's Christmas. And yours truly is one of the very lucky individuals with a brand shiny new Nintendo 64 just unwrapped under the tree. Ah, oh, what a magnificent console the N64 was. Ah, oh, right up there with the GameCube. Two brilliant Nintendo consoles. I used to be a massive Nintendo kid, so yeah, I had a Super NES and then I got a Nintendo 64. That was brilliant. Um... And obviously at the same time, I was I was kind of, you know, getting quite into games. So I obviously did the one thing that all the cool kids did at that time. And that is I got myself a subscription to N64 magazine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember the days when the Internet was kind of uh, the Internet was made a terrifying, horrifying noise when you tried to uh, log on to it. And uh, it was incredibly slow and there wasn't much useful information on it. So, you know, if you wanted information about games, you got that by looking in a magazine. Oh, magnificent. Oh, what the heck? No, 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 no. Oh, cock six. Right. Sorry about that. Thanks to two guys at the bottom who I hadn't apparently disarmed yet or who found guns from somewhere or other, I've just had to do all that again. Things went pretty much exactly the same, except this time uh, I had to disarm a couple of guys down in the tunnels. So, back to 1997, and there we are with our subscription to N64 Magazine, issue 10, the Christmas special, in which they reviewed Diddy Kong Racing and said it was 1% worse than Mario Kart 64. Still disagree with that. And at the back of it, they had a feature about this thing in Japan called Pocket Monsters. And me, I thought, and all of a sudden there was this this thing in Japan that could be played in a Game Boy. I think that up to that point, I couldn't really, you know, hadn't really done much more advanced than Super Mario Land or Tetris. You know, I, I was kind of amazed that it was capable of doing something where it promised you could, like, wander around a world and choose what creatures to capture and which to raise and, you know, what would be your team. And there were all the different types and gym leaders and battles and you could make yourself the champion, the Pokemon champion of the world. So it's like... Oh my goodness, this was the most exciting thing ever. Because I, I wasn't big into RPGs, I was a racing fan. I like, you know, I would really enjoyed like um, Mario Kart and the Super NES and Diddy Kong Racing on the N64. That was the game I got uh, when I got an N64. Like the idea of RPGs, I hadn't really got into RPGs. I was never like majorly into the SNES RPGs at all. So the young me, excitable young me, decided that I had to have this game. And I knew that this was going to be huge. I mean, I, I was way ahead of the zeitgeist in this. I knew that this game was going to be massive. But for when this was like literally this, this was the first anyone in the UK had ever really heard of it. Like this thing. It wasn't even called Pokemon. It was Pocket Monsters back then. I'm not sure they'd even come up with the, the um, I then really come up with the name uh, Pokemon yet to the best of my knowledge. Um, so what I did in my excitement was I marched straight down into the town. And when I say into the town, I, I lived in a, a really tiny, crappy town when I was growing up. Like, there was there was no game store. The concept of a game store was something, you know, you had to drive half an hour in another direction to get to. So instead, I went to the only shop in town that did have a very small games rack. And that was WH Smith's. 
And anyone in Britain is probably now laughing at me because they know W. H. Smith's is basically a stationery store. It sells, you know, pens and pads of paper, and you know, like it's got a really, really crappy, uninteresting display of like a few CDs and a few games in it. But back in these days, that was literally the only shop in my town that sold this game. I marched up to the counter in 1997. And I said I wanted to reserve Pocket Monsters. And and bless them, even though, you know, this game didn't even have a release date yet, they they did write me a little piece of paper saying that I had it I had it reserved. I had it reserved for launch day. And if I recall correctly, it took uh it took over a year after that point for this game to actually come out in the UK. But oh eventually it did, obviously it did, and I was on launch day, you know what I did? I marched right down to W. H. Smith's, I had this little piece of paper which I've been keeping safe in a cupboard for a whole year, and I took it there, and I, and I was walking to town, and I knew, ah, all the other fools, you know, now there's this massive cultural phenomenon that's finally made it to the UK, everyone else is going to be like, you know, it's going to be sold out, but there's going to be one copy that's reserved for me. And I was a bit surprised as I approached W. H. Smith's, because... There wasn't a queue uh, outside going out the doors. In fact, there wasn't there wasn't anyone at all. And I went inside, and sure enough, they had actually got a load of launch day copies. In fact, they got a big display. But other than that, the shop was pretty much entirely deserted. So I went up to the counter, and um, but you know, I'd I brought this damn thing. I'd I, you know, I'd I'd been saving this. Uh, I'd been saving this certificate for years and years and years. So flipping hell, yes, I was actually going to use it. And I walked up to the counter and just kind of slightly sheepishly handed over my reservation slip to them. They looked at it, read it, a bit confusion on their faces. And eventually, um, and then the guy behind the counter literally stepped out from behind the counter, walked over to the, the stand of games with Pokemon on it that he'd just seen, picked the first copy off the shelf, brought it back, and rung it up on the cash on the cash register for me. <laughs> oh dear! And yeah, literally, I don't know. I I don't even think it was a real reservation slip in respect. I think they literally just they were confused, so they wrote down that I had pocket monsters reserved, and this guy just kind of had to assume that Pokemon and pocket monsters were the same thing. Um, but uh, I I left quite quickly, and uh, that was the start of a bit of a love affair. I love that game more than anything else. I. You know, I, I trained a whole team up to level 100 in that game. Easily, I remember my first team, Blastoise and Victory Bell. That was how I beat the Elite Four on my first time through. I had like a level, I think it was about a level 81 Blastoise and a level 72 Victory Bell. Uh, that that was the only, those were the only two Pokemon I had. Uh, that was how I got, that was how I got through the game the first time I played it. And since then I've owned Silver, Crystal, Sapphire, uh, emerald, diamond, platinum, and black. And I haven't actually, I haven't actually got X or Y yet. Um, I admit, I kind of, I didn't really get into black that much, so I don't know. I just kind of hadn't really, uh, I don't know. I'm less into Pokemon than I used to be. Um, but it was still kind of, it was an amazing first game, and I do kind of remember when Silver came out and I got it on launch day. Silver blew my mind, and still blows my mind actually, because. It was running on a Game Boy. This is, you know, basically the same console that Tetris was made on. Silver is just a technical masterpiece. In terms of quality and technical sophistication of a game versus the technology that it was running on, Silver is probably one of the most advanced games that will ever be made. Pokemon Silver, amazing, amazing game. So yeah, Pokemon, that was really the, uh, that was the first game that I was really passionate about. So another question people put to me, um, who were my favourite YouTubers? Um, I'm going to put three, I'm going to put, I'm going to say three for three different reasons. Firstly, I probably owe a great debt to Nerdcubed, um, for the simple reason that, uh, obviously, um, I don't know whether, I think kind of, it's been commented on a few times actually below the line. People have noticed similarities between the style that I do in terms of editing and humour and, and Nerdcube shows. Part of that's coincidence, part of that's just because we're both British and there is a certain kind of dry, sarcastic, slightly surreal British sense of humour that's just a thing. 
that I think me and him share. So I was uh, hugely inspired by uh, the editing style that uh, that he did in terms of like the the rapid cuts, the the a lot of work going into editing to cut jokes together. Like a lot of that, a lot of what we do here probably wouldn't have happened if I hadn't seen that. But I know he said that he was inspired by Hannah Harto. So in some ways, this channel is indirectly descended uh, from Hannah Hart. Uh, the other one I want to select is I do want to say Chugga Conroy is probably one of the few people I will like. I will literally watch everything he puts out um, just because I think he is the master of two things. I think he is the master of remarkably well thought out, structured um, Let's Plays, which I think is good. I think he has the most relaxing style and voice. I love watching him in the evening. I think it's just a very relaxing experience. So. Uh, yeah, that's just something I really, really enjoy personally. But actually, you know, I'll also give a shout out to um, to Lag TV. That's Maximus Black and Nova War, who do StarCraft 2. I used to be massively in StarCraft when I was at you know, university, uh, when StarCraft 1 uh, as an eSport was just starting to gain a little bit of awareness in the UK. Uh, me and a couple of friends of mine, we used to uh, we used to get up in the early morning to watch StarCraft games being broadcast live from Korea. The finals, some of the grand finals between Flash and Stork, the games between Flash and Jadong. I used to be so into that. And I'm still kind of into watching uh, StarCraft 2 shouts, but these days it's mainly just the people who I enjoy the commentator more than the game. And I think what uh, Lag TV are absolute masters of is they don't even, even like, they will sometimes do a 20 minute commentary where they don't talk about the game at all. They barely even mention, like, what's happening in the game. They'll keep the camera following it so you can see what's going on, but they'll just be talking about whatever comes into their heads and they bounce off each other really well it's just really entertaining they can just make they can take literally nothing of what's happening in front of them make it work for 20 minutes and that that's an amazing skill they've got such kind of wonderful chemistry i think they're great frustratingly in this particular version of the game four of them have decided to go and hang out by the cars which is really annoying because normally you only need to make uh two trips from the cars back up uh because it's just the priest and uh, it's only the priest and the journalist. But in this particular case, unfortunately, uh, two of the guards have decided to stumbly stay down by the cars too. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of stuck with that. Come on, guys, up you come. Another question someone asked was, Skyrim, why aren't you doing Skyrim? Skyrim will happen. Skyrim will happen one day or other. The problem, and it will be Skyrim no kill. It won't be Skyrim kill everything if you... You know, if you think Skyrim kill everything would be good, just just go into any city in Skyrim and start trying to do a kill everything, and you'll find mysteriously that like half or more of every character in every city oh, just sort of can't knew. be killed for no well explained reason. Like Skyrim is a nightmare. Like no one interesting can be killed unless it's actually part of a you know a, a scripted mission to kill them. It's really frustrating. You just can't get away with anything. Uh, so yeah, massively frustrating, so I won't do Skyrim, I kill everything. I will do Skyrim no kill, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Between like the Illusion School of Magic in general, and stealth, and other little bits and pieces that you can do to avoid detection, I think there's some really fascinating stuff that you can do in Skyrim um, for avoiding trouble and getting out of trouble. So I'll definitely be doing that at some point or other. But it takes a lot of planning. The thing that's going on just gets so massive, the amount of planning it takes is insane. So I will need to set aside a significant part of time to actually do some kind of testing and playthroughs and kind of test runs into it. So that's not going to come imminently. That will be a major commitment whenever I do. Someone else, well, my favourite music in a game is I probably have to give that to the end run theme in Mass Effect 2. In fact, if you ask me to kind of, you know, if you force me to give awards out to all games ever, I'd probably end up giving quite a lot of awards out to uh, to Mass Effect 2. I think it's a fantastic game, um, utterly, utterly genius game. I think it's also got, um, it's got the best opening in any game ever. Um, with the uh, the whole business with the collector ship attacking the Normandy and uh, how that ends and begins the game, that's just I, I think it's the best it's the best opening of any game ever. Though I I'd also be very tempted to actually um, give an honourable mention in game music to Banjo Kazooie, Banjo Kazooie on the N sixty four. I want to give that an honourable mention. Uh, my all oh, the good music there, Treasure Trove Cove. Goodness sake, Tristro Cove. Tristro Cove, one of my favourite levels of all time, actually. In terms of, like, it, I remember it as being kind of one of the first big open spaces. When people kind of talk about, like, um, 
their first moment where they got to go in a game into a big wide open kind of world they could explore. A lot of people talk about Hyrule Field in Ocarina of Time, and, and you know, I've, I've got fond memories of Ocarina of Time as much as anyone else who had an N64, but it was Treasure Trove Cove in Banjo-Kazooie that I think actually kind of was more, as uh, was the more spectacular achievement as far as it's this massive sprawling island and you get to fly around it. Uh, it's just a, it's it's one of my favourite levels. Uh, it's one of my favourite levels in all the game. I actually love Banjo Kazooie and I love Treasure Trove Cove. I think it's just such a shame that well, one Banjo Tui was relatively uninspiring, and then Nuts and Bolts was was Nuts and Bolts really. <laughs> Again, Banjo Kazooie re-released on the XBLA, if I remember correctly. Want to see it? Let me know. And then there's kind of, there were a couple of kind of um, there were a couple of kind of longer, more difficult to answer, serious questions that uh, that two people put forward, um, and these kind of deserve some proper explanation. So one person asked kind of what was it that inspired me to do these kind of um, these obscure playthrough videos that I do. I'm really excited by gaming. Gaming is an industry that's now become bigger than film in terms of the amount of money it makes. It's going to become bigger and bigger, demographically. Everything is on our side because, uh, for example, like um, people, some people in my family um, who are kind of in their mid thirties at the moment who have kids, they grew up with consoles, and they're kind of really the first generation that actually grew up with gaming just as a perfectly normal everyday pastime. Who are now having kids, and those kids have, you know, albeit you know under supervision and the right consoles, and for only a limited amount of time per day. Those kids literally have had consoles for as long as they can remember. It's in the same way that my nieces can use iPhones better than me, and that's kind of scary in its own way too. Demographically, more and more people are going to be gamers as time goes by. The generation that kind of is much more into, you know, old-style broadcast TV and going to the movies and things like that, that ultimately is demographically going to fade away in favour of people who are more based around getting their entertainment online and who want to interact with their entertainment and play games in some capacity or other. This industry is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more exciting and it's going to have teething problems. I mean no one's going to deny that you know there's always going to be teething problems when a new technology grows and gets bigger and new technology gets introduced. Over you go my good man. Bye. But it's still exciting. It's immensely exciting and Part of the reason it's exciting, aside from the fact that I just think it's quite frankly an inevitability that gaming will become bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes by, is that gaming is about choice. Your secret's safe with me. I swear to God, I won't tell a soul. You're a journalist. Don't even, don't lie to me. You're a journalist. We can debate the merits of any other media kind of for a very long time, but... Gaming is pretty much the only interactive medium. It is a completely unique medium in that regard. It is all about choice and the player interaction. And that is not just like a unique selling point. That is obviously creates some wonderful opportunities for creating new methods for storytelling. Because up to now, for three millennia of human history that we kind of have particularly competent records for, we pretty much understand how stories work, which is in some capacity there is a storyteller, whether that be a human reading something by oral tradition or a book or a TV show or a film, it doesn't matter. There is a storyteller and you are the passive recipient of the story. Your only interaction is how you choose to respond to what's been put in front of you. And sure, there's some interesting stuff in terms of how you interpret stories, but basically you are absorbing a story as is laid out. Gaming is completely unique in so far as it presents the opportunity for you to actually do things uh, your own way. And this is why I'm very dismissive of games where basically they clearly don't want to be interactive, where really all you're doing is moving along a very narrow corridor between predefined set pieces and cutscenes, because if you're going to do that, you've completely missed the whole point of this medium. Don't even bother with this medium, just go and make a film. Gaming has the ability to genuinely revolutionise not just the entertainment industry, but the very concept of how storytelling works. I genuinely believe that. I think it's very, very exciting. And I think presenting players with choices 
that make them have to that will kind of make them think will get people emotionally involved in stories potentially more than they ever have been before it's why i'm very very i'm very very interested in things like telltale games and why i'm going to be doing the walking dead soon i think the walking dead is a fascinating example of making people of games creating agonizing choices that are much more interesting than simply reading about someone making an agonizing choice. I genuinely believe that's very, very exciting. So because I believe games are all about choice, I'm really, really in favor of trying to kind of give some love to the games that give you genuinely huge amounts of choice and actually let let you play the game your way, where the game has, you know, doesn't, rather than actually presenting kind of like a way or a, cho you know, or a very clearly defined choice, like you have the moral or you have the paragon or the renegade option, please choose one of these two things. Instead, you live in a world where um, you actually have the freedom to do all sorts of things, where the game devs have actually kind of very carefully gone out of the way to create a very intricate series of mechanics and come up with all sorts of quite subtle ways for you to discover how you might make them interact with each other in order to play the game by your own set of rules. And that, I think, is kind of what... Um, that really is what Fallout New Vegas No Kill uh, was all about at its core. And, you know, I love doing things like that. Someone asked me what my favourite games are. I've put some thought into this one. This one's tough. My favourite game has to be Fallout New Vegas. I've just never... It's just It's just not just an amazing game, but it's everything that I want out of a game. And it's everything, to my mind, that elevates gaming to such a wonderful art form with so much potential to it. Uh, genuinely, I'm so, so excited by gaming as an art form. I'm going to say my top five after Fallout New Vegas. Uh, Fallout New Vegas number one. Resident Evil 4 number two for probably my favorite my i think my favorite shooter mechanics in every get in any game ever just because the the balance of it is wonderful i think it's got way better shooter mechanics than fallout new vegas incidentally i think kind of probably in terms of in some ways it, it you could definitely argue it's the better game just because the balance of the guns and the way the guns all work and fit together is just beautiful it's 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 a wonderful wonderful game in that regard skies of arcadia my favourite story in any gaming ever, brilliant game, Dreamcast and then re-released on the GameCube, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful game, looks a bit scabby now but I don't care, it's just got a wonderful, light, happy but epic story, beautifully told, wonderful score, one of my kind of favourite story experiences in games ever because it doesn't have the freedom of New Vegas but it has a really strong focus and a really strong narrative and really good series of characters so kind of one of my favorite stories in uh, one of my favorite stories in gaming of all time Pokemon Silver I've kind of already said I'd, pro I'd probably just give this to the whole Pokemon franchise or at least everything from generation 4 backwards but if I had to pick one I'd say Pokemon Silver all things considered um and then Advance Wars 2 my favourite strategy game, my favourite strategy game of all time, but also with a brilliant story, a brilliant campaign, brilliant mechanics, beautifully balanced, beautiful art style, just a fantastic game overall. That was on the GBA, seriously, hunt that one down, it's so cheap these days, and it's just a magnificent series, and such a travesty that the game that came after it was a dark conflict. Oh, what a disaster of a game that was. It's possibly the worst sequel to a brilliant game since Resident Evil 5 followed Resident Evil 4. Other than that, honourable mentions go to Hitman Blood Money, obviously, which to my mind, what we're doing right now, my favourite ending to a game ever. Though, admittedly, I'm doing it a little bit slowly and silly at the moment. Um, Fallout 3, obviously. Wind Waker. All of those get really off. Get obviously uh, get uh, very very good men. Get uh, some very very good mentions. And then one final question that uh, that I was asked that I do actually want to uh, that I do want to cover. This one, this one was this one was kind of this one was a big one for me. Uh, people asked kind of how doing YouTube has changed things for me. And I want to say three things. I want to say three things to that. One, it's given me a newfound respect for the people that do this professionally because. This is a lot of work. An episode, a typical episode of Fallout 3 Kill Everything is three hours of recording, three and a half hours editing, 
rendering and uploading take a ton of time too and then kind of you know making some gifs to share with the fallout subreddit to you know keep people interested in it that takes a lot of, it take it can probably you know it can take a lot of time to do a single episode of 20 minutes it's it's a lot of effort that goes into this and the second that i'm going to say is the thing i'm going to say is I've been touched by the number of personal messages I've received. Like, I, I genuinely thought, like, this was going to be... I genuinely thought this was just going to be me putting some little videos out on the internet and some people might find them funny and some people might find them interesting. But, like, at Christmas last year, the number of Christmas wishes I got from you guys, that was amazing. I was just so so touched. I was genuinely touched. That was just, like, amazing how many people seem to actually, like care about this channel and care about this community that was kind of amazing and the third and final one actually let me just toss this guy over an edge first yep ah 47 47 and his grumpy bald head pretty happy and everyone died of a mysterious accident where they all happened to fall down the same flight of stairs oops oh well and uh yep as the story wraps up in hitman blood money um the one other way that this is this whole experience, um, these hundred videos have really have really changed uh, changed things for me is the multiple instances where people have reached out to me, not just to send me kind of you know messages saying how much they're enjoying things, but for whom this has become something more important than the videos to them, the people for whom you know they're going through some tough times in one way or another, and for whom this is. This this helps them in some way. This kind of this helps them. This cheers them up, or this is something that they enjoy on a regular basis, and that that uh, you know it helps them with their routine. Whatever it is, there are people out there for whom this has kind of become something that's actually important to them more than I ever anticipated. And that's that is humbling. That is humbling to me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm honoured that I produce something that kind of can help people in that way. That that has genuinely moved me, and I'm, I'm, you know, really glad if there's anything that I can do to help people in that regard. Genuinely, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. As the credits roll, that is Hitman Blood Money, the entire game completed without a single kill against our name. Hitman Agent Forty Seven. Unfortunately, just a bit of an unlucky guy. Lots of accidents seem to happen around him. Oh well, never mind. And yeah, that's also the 100th video. That's the 100th video. We've got up to, at the time of recording, it's about 4,600 subscribers. That's kind of amazing. It's also, I find it amazing that okay, I think at one point someone commented that uh, when they were told it was that number replied, this guy only has 4,600. Oh, bless you. Bless you, whoever that was. I'm glad that we're producing content that feels like it belongs amongst the big players on the YouTube community. I'm uh, I'm thrilled about that. That's uh, that cheers me up no end, if nothing else. No outro screen, unfortunately, so I can't verify for you um, with the actual figures that that is nothing but accidents. But you know, it's everyone falling off a ledge. So in Hitman Blood Money, that's an accident. But that's the end of Hitman Blood Money. I may do some more Hitman at some point. You want to see Hitman 2 or Hitman Contracts? I've got the HD releases of both of them. Let me know if you're interested. I've been John. This has been Menu True Nerd. That's been Hitman Blood Money. And this has been 100 videos so far. And uh, here's to 100 more, eh? Thank you very much. And goodbye. We're stuck in a hole. Look. Borderlands is back, by the way. You're running me over, though. That, okay. That's me <laughs> under the wheel. That is me under the wheel. Also, you're uh, now my... laying me next to it. You're not going to get in the town. Not going to happen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> damn it. Damn <laughs> you. The hero of Canton, the man they call James.